I began my journey into activism at a very young age. I was 11 when I first found out about our food system and GMOs, and my world was turned upside down. GMOs are genetically modified organisms, and it's where corporations can own, patent, and modify seeds, our food, plants, and other living organisms, often to pair them with pesticides and herbicides. I was outraged when I found out that GMOs were linked to a variety of health and environmental issues, and yet they weren't labeled here in Canada. I felt that my basic right to democracy, my basic right to choose the food that I put in my body, was being taken away from me. And that's when I decided to say something. As with all forms of activism, everything starts off small. My first speech was for a huge audience of 12 people. And of course that grows. I wanted to turn my anger into solid action. And that's when our first Kids' Right to Know march happened. And with no resources and no funding, I turned towards social media, and specifically Twitter, in order to spread the message. Then that led me to challenging Kevin O'Leary after, on public television, he said that anyone marching against Monsanto was stupid, and that if they didn't like GMOs, they should just stop eating. Of course, I had problems with this, and I debate, uh, debated him on public television on CBC. The debate happened, and 10 million views later, my life had effectively changed. This then led me to crashing a Monsanto shareholder meeting. And Monsanto is one of the largest corporations patenting our food. And I confronted the CEO about the damages that he was causing to our health and the environment. I also asked why they spend millions of dollars every single year to stop consumers from having the right to know what's in their food and preventing us from having labeling. But soon after, my fight for GMO labeling became about so much more became about protecting our environment and our Earth from our food choices. Not so long ago, when we were all growing up, we didn't really have to think about the impending issues affecting our Earth. Our parents, families, friends, even neighbors, seemed to live in this limitless world of opportunities and consumerism from plastics to fast fashion. But today, we can't deny that human activity and lack of understanding have caused incredible, almost irreversible damage to our Earth. We've taken for granted nature's diversity and incredible gift that gives us all life. We can't deny witnessing record-breaking floods and heat waves, entire neighborhoods engulfed in flames. We can't deny seeing that billions of dollars of crops are lost due to storms, or even the fact that South Africa is rapidly running out of water and our pollinators, birds, and thousands of other species are in decline. We can't ignore the thousands of young people flooding the streets, marching for climate action and to save our futures. Climate change is expected to push over 100 million people into extreme poverty by 2030. Over half of all plants and animals are in danger due to climate change. And we are expected to have more difficulties growing food and water. The UN says that we have less than 12 years to avert catastrophe. We are witnessing climate change worsen by the day. Our generation is being faced with problems that were unheard of only decades ago, that are affecting our lives today and any possibilities for our future. Our Earth is being covered in a blanket of carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and other gases that are building up and causing our Earth to heat. This rise in global temperatures is causing our polar ice caps to melt, uh, causing flooding and droughts, making it more difficult for farmers to grow the food necessary to feed growing populations, and threatening the livelihoods and homes of millions of people, often those most vulnerable. We are no longer predicting global heating and the climate chaos that ensues. We are instead living it. Our politicians, governments, and corporations continue to put an emphasis on economy rather than protecting our environment. But the irony is that without a healthy environment, there is no business, no money, no trade. There can be no economic activity on a dead planet. Climate change is a symptom of us all. 
of all of our actions, all of our activities. And while it can be easy to point the finger at corporations and governments for all that they've done, and don't get me wrong, we definitely need to hold them accountable. We also need to look at ourselves, at our own consumerism. Look at who and what we are supporting when we buy something like plastics, meat, something as simple as canola oil. Sadly, at this point in time, it would be impossible or would take millions of years for us to reverse ocean acidification, to bring back our dead coral reefs, or to revive lost species. But what if I told you that there was a solution to climate change that we could all be a part of that could start to draw down this carbon in our atmosphere? And what if I told you that this solution was right beneath our feet and at the end of our forks? We all know that our food provides us with the nutrients and the energy to sustain life. But did you know that food also impacts our pollinators, our marine life, even our climate? You may not know, but industrial agriculture is one of the largest contributors to climate change and global warming. Currently, taking the fact that we are cutting down our Amazon rainforests in order to grow palm oil and genetically modified soy. Or think of the amount of methane that's released from cows in factory farms, or the amount of nitrous oxide from excess use of chemical fertilizers that's making its way into our rivers, our lakes, and our oceans, contributing to ocean acidification. All in all, industrial agriculture contributes about 50% of all greenhouse gas emissions. That's more than all manufacturing, that's more than all transportation, and yet, no one seems to be talking about it. Animal agriculture plays a huge role in this discussion. Majority of the meat that people eat is coming from factory farms where animals are kept indoors their entire lives and are fed mostly a diet of genetically modified soy and corn that is doused in toxic pesticides and herbicides. They're also given antibiotics and steroids in order to increase growth. The amount of methane that comes from these farms is incredibly strong as contributing to climate change to almost irreversible points, and the waste that comes from these farms is polluting our wildlife, water, and rivers. According to a study in 2009 from the Netherlands, if each and every one of us could cut down on our meat consumption, not only would our greenhouse gas emissions significantly decrease, but there would be wonderful health benefits as well. Globally, we spend about $60 trillion every decade on healthcare. A majority of that goes towards preventable and curable food-related illnesses. If we could simply change the way that we eat food, not only would there be great economic wealth, there would also be better health and environmental issues that would all be fixed. In addition, uh, we often talk about the need to grow genetically modified foods in order to feed our world. The reality is, is that we're growing about eight times more food on eight times more land for animals and livestock than we do use for people. If we were to simply reuse this land for humans and growing food for us, we would have enough food to feed populations for generations to come. So it's not about the amount of food that we create, but it's how we grow it. And it should be grown smartly, organically, and regeneratively in a way that can not only feed the world, but cool our planet. And according to a study published in Climatic Change, the average meat eater contributes almost twice as much to climate change as the average vegetarian, and almost three times as much as the average vegan. Now, I'm not here to tell you all that you need to become vegetarian or vegan, but if we could all make small sacrifices in our own lives, it would be enough to make a huge difference. We also need to move away from our current industrialized and chemical systems of agriculture that include genetically modified crops. In order to grow genetically modified foods, they need to use very intensive chemicals that are damaging our soil and releasing more carbon into our atmosphere. The best way to grow food is in a regenerative and non-GMO form. And we can do this not only by changing diets and our consumption, we can make such a huge difference, but the best way to cut down on genetically modified crops is by making a conscious effort to buy non-GMO uh, and organic products and avoiding ingredients such as corn, canola, soy, and sugar from sugar beet, the main genetically modified foods. Of course, there isn't just one solution to climate change. There are many things that each and every one of us can do. 
And of course, cutting down on fossil fuels and moving towards renewable energy is something that we still need to strive for. But at this point in time, it still wouldn't be enough. Our world already has so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that even if we were to cut out all fossil fuels today, there would still be so much excess that climate change would still be a very relevant issue. What we need to do is start to draw down this carbon in order to make a big difference. And there is hope and a chance for a better future, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. It can be extremely overwhelming, but we do have solutions. When we damage our soil, it releases carbon into the atmosphere. But by nourishing our soil, it actually has the capability of capturing carbon from our atmosphere and storing it in the soil. And this type of agriculture is called regenerative organic agriculture. Not only can it reverse climate change, but it can increase nutrition, it can double our food production, and it can help during uh, times of drought, which we're seeing more and more. And I have a quick video to show you about this. Soil is a living miracle. In one handful of soil, there are more organisms than there are humans on Earth. And we are only beginning to understand this vast network of beings right beneath our feet. We rely on healthy soil for 95% of what we eat. Yet, we take it for granted. Thousands of years of plowing, deforestation, and erosion have left our soils in dire shape. And we're accelerating the loss of this essential resource. But there's a lot more to the story. When soil is damaged, it releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And this has had serious consequences for the climate. Too much carbon in the atmosphere is causing the Earth to overheat. That excess carbon is also acidifying our oceans, threatening marine life. Meanwhile, there's not enough carbon where it once was, in the soil. In fact, many of the world's cultivated soils have lost more than 50% of their original carbon stocks. But there's actually some good news. We now know how to put carbon back in the soil where it belongs. Plants capture carbon dioxide in their leaves and pump the carbon down through their roots to feed hungry microorganisms living in the soil. Now, what had been atmospheric carbon, a problem, becomes soil carbon, a solution. Practices like keeping soil covered with plants, increasing crop diversity, composting, and carefully planned grazing are proven ways to put carbon back into the soil. Carbon-rich soils act like giant sponges absorbing water during floods and providing it to plants in times of drought. And adding carbon to soil makes the land much more productive. The French government recognizes this and is calling on all countries to join them in increasing soil carbon by 0.4% each year. If every nation were to reach this ambitious but achievable goal, we could store 75% of global annual greenhouse gas emissions, enough to make a real difference to our planet's future well-being. Of course, we still need to reduce our fossil fuel emissions, but we don't need to develop expensive or risky technologies. Instead, what we need is a lot more photosynthesis. Climate change can be overwhelming, Yet, there is real hope. Healthy soil can be a major sink for carbon. But this fact hasn't been well known until now. Because now we know a soil solution is right beneath our feet.
Click on the link below to find out what you can do to help rebuild our soils. It's time to start connecting the dots between our toxic food and farming, destruction of our oceans, deforestation, climate change, and the decline in public health. Our generation who has contributed the least to this problem is already suffering the consequences of actions made by generations before us. If we believe in food sustainability, if we believe in leaving our world a better place and having safe access to food and water for all, then we need to change our ways. We need to cut down on our meat. We need to live non-GMO, plant-based diets. We need to move away from fossil fuels and towards regenerative and organic agriculture. These are the solutions that we have right at the fingertips. And although this may seem like a small concept, together, multiplied by the millions and millions of people who live on this earth, these are huge steps. The earth is obviously not a fragile place. It's been around for millions of years and has survived extinctions, floods, fires. What is not fragile is the Earth itself, but all life on Earth. We are now in a fight for our own survival and the survival of generations to come. Our Earth clothes us, feeds us, nourishes us, but right now, it's in a degenerative state. And in order to see the true change that we need, every single one of us in this room has to realize that we all have an incredible potential to do more. We have to imagine the kind of world that we want to live in, and not become overwhelmed by the amount of issues, but instead feel empowered and compelled to change them. Some of the actions that we can take even start in our own homes, in our kitchens, looking and questioning ingredients that we choose. Planting seeds, planting trees and native species without the use of chemicals, fertilizers, pesticides, or herbicides. Composting. Making your own food and growing food if you can. Buying organic and non-GMO, cutting down on our meat. These are all small things that we can all be a part of. Right now, the world needs you more than ever. We all need to become activists in our own daily lives. And as much as these may seem like small ideas, we're all a part of the bigger picture. And when it comes down to our small, everyday purchases, remember that every single dollar you spend is a vote. And in the climate revolution, every vote counts. Not only do we have the capability to make a better world, we can help to create that world every single day. In other words, every bite counts because there is no planet B. Thank you.